Hi everybody, what's going on? I'm DJ Sixsmith. You're watching The Sit Down. Lauren Duke is here with us today. Brand new book, How to Start a Revolution. How are you? <laughs> Thanks for having me. You got it. So me and my wife both read this book and we really enjoyed it. And it's something that's perfect for the time because there is a lot to think about and you're a very passionate person when it comes to this. So this has been a pretty incredible journey for you. So what have been some of the more memorable parts of writing this book, talking about this book, just in engaging with people from all different sides of the aisle? <laughs> well, it started for me with the election. Mm -hmm. I woke up on November 9th, 2016, completely shocked yeah. by Trump's win, like so many other people. And what it changed for me is my sense of agency. I suddenly realized that I needed to have an active role in government by and for the people, and I almost don't know how to totally explain to you hmm. my before state. Uh, yeah, what did that even look like? I can't even imagine it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, I, I, I th there was this disconnect. Hmm. I understood democracy in the abstract, and I thought of it as this historical achievement that would guide us toward this equitable future. Um, and things, things would kind of gradually get better all the time, but, but politics seemed as if they were separate from my life, that it was you know, something, something that I couldn't actually affect. And so when I had this awakening moment, I wrote a piece called Donald Trump is Gaslighting mm -hmm. America. I published it in Teen Vogue, and it went massively viral. And it completely changed my life. I was catapulted to this public platform, and because the piece was published in Teen Vogue, I became this kind of informal spokesperson for young people. <laughs> and I was routinely being asked, why don't young people care mm. about politics? And this question is posited as if it's a natural extension of low turnout statistics. Young people don't vote, so they must be apathetic. Except from my own experience, I did not feel as if that was the case. Mm. I was passionate about social justice before, but I didn't have a sense of self-determination in terms of raising my voice as a political subject. And so I started researching and reporting. I started talking to other young people who told me they had had this sort of awakening. And they all also fumbled for the words to explain this before state, this, this sense of alienation and what had clicked for them. But what was different now is that they had this sense of agency. They had moved from passively navigating this broken system that they did not care about, but they felt disenfranchised to change. Mm -hmm. And and what, what happened with Trump's election or whatever woke them up, maybe it was the Black Lives Matter movement, later Parkland, Me Too, they saw the structural realities of the status quo and their role within it and, and insisted on having the agency to be the change they wished to see. And that might have meant running for office, starting nonprofits, or at a lower level, just regularly taking civic action. What fundamentally changed, though, is this relationship to government. And I think that that sort of insurgency is spreading. Um, and it's been, when I first responded to the election, I had this overwhelming sense of fear and mm -hmm. dread. And things are still absolutely horrible yeah. and in a state of the dumpster fire, but I am really optimistic at what I'm seeing among the youngest generations, which is a fundamental shift in how we think about citizenship. I think that's most surprising to me is that how engaged people have been post-Trump being elected because we knew that it was going to be a really difficult situation for a lot of different people, but it was people that hadn't been marginalized before that mm -hmm. were really starting to feel things for the first time, and then those people are jumping in. So you document a lot of different young people here from Parkland all throughout the country. Who were some of the groups that really spoke to you and really just struck a chord with you that you're like, wow, this is awesome that you guys are doing this? Uh, the, the Parkland students are a great example. A lot of the young people who decided to run for office, yeah. including on down-ballot elections. I mean, we have these awesome, exciting rock star examples. I also interviewed Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Mm -hmm. But then you have one of my favorite stories is there's a young woman named Heather Ward. She was covering the school board as a high school student. She thought, maybe there should be a student perspective on the school board. Probably a good board, idea, right? But I'll wait my turn. Uh, it'll happen eventually. I'm not ready yet. It, it, like, it was an, it was a, she didn't feel as if she had permission. Mm -hmm. And then he won, she ran, and she won. And the thing that's amazing about that is it reflects the, the, the gist of so many of the stories, it, it wasn't about just reacting to Trump. It, so many of the amazing young people I spoke to were tapping into the issues they cared about before, the things they were passionate about that they thought someone else would change or they would eventually have the right to change. And, and with this awakening, they said, well, it's got to be me. And, and, and there, there were so many examples like that, I, for a while, started to get worried because mm. I was like, I'm talking to 
all the kids who are Lisa Simpsoning it up right now. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm just talking like the exceptional outliers. Like right. I'm worried that I th like that, does this represent the majority, right? But then I found the Millennial Impact Report, which is this mm. longitudinal ethnographic study. So I was ta I talked to hundreds of young people to do this work, and and when I first had my awakening moment, I put a call out on Twitter and I got over 300 responses in less than 24 hours. I toured the country talking to college students, talking to high school students. Still tough to make a broad generational claim based on what I can mm -hmm. do as an interviewer. What this study showed me is that at demographic scale, um, in terms of the, the characteristics that define the youngest Americans, we can actually talk about this behavioral change. And yeah. so, so at the most exceptional level, it looks like starting nonprofits and running for office and changing your life completely in some way. But at lower levels, it's still that shift in agency where, where it once seemed possible to be tapped out or like there was nothing you could do. Suddenly, there's this urgency to at least follow local and national news and be informed enough to discuss politics and to vote, or to be regularly contacting elected officials or protesting or making donations. Suddenly, this sense of a right and a duty to civic action is, is uh, paramount among the youngest in a way that it's been denied to us before. Totally, and we separated these conversations for so long, but let's be real, like, politics has always been in our pop culture, in yeah. our sports, in our conversations, but if we disagreed with people, we didn't want to get into it because it was awkward, it was a little bit strange, but then suddenly we're kind of forced to now, and your conversation with <laughs> your dad is obviously a little microcosm of this whole thing, but uh -huh. the growth that you guys have had, because clearly, difference of opinion, can't, you don't want to talk about politics at home, but now at least you could talk about it. How have you guys grown in that relationship? Uh, yeah, I would say shout out to my dad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I love my dad very much, and we've evolved a lot through this. Mm -hmm. uh, I was shocked to find on election day that both of my parents were going to vote for Trump. Mm -hmm. uh, they are sort of tapped out, uh, or you know, I think that they were in a similar phase of alienation that I was, even though they're, they were ideologically different. Their attitude, their relationship to politics, it was this sense of, well, our votes don't really matter. They didn't understand their complicity in the system, and I was horrified by this man winning and that my parents had voted for him. So I, I cut them off for mm. a long time because it was their rule that we were not allowed to talk about politics. Right. Um, and so here I am catapulting <laughs> to public figure dumb in resistance to the president, and my parents are like, let's just keep it nice. And you're like, I need to talk ah! about my life with you. you I'm know? like, one, this is my job. Two, I've had this epiphany where right. I now understand everything is political. Mm. So I eventually came back to them, and I basically said, I'm approaching you now as a journalist, not even as your daughter. I mean, I'm not lying to you as your daughter, but as a journalist, my goal is to empower people with information and, and to, to create this foundation of fact so that we can have conversations about how we live together. We might have differences of opinion in that analysis part, in that subjective piece of political opinion, and I am an opinion writer, mm -hmm. and I'm very progressive, and I'm battling for public equality, and in, in in, in, that's not typically been their passion mm -hmm. piece. Right. But we have to at least be, get a degree on what's true and be willing to have these conversations. And um, part, part of how I was raised, I think, a lot of people will find relatable where it's this idea that it's rude to talk about mm -hmm. politics. It's rude to bring up politics with someone who you might disagree with. And that's absurd because the stuff of democracy is having debates right. and building consensus from debates. And we have to endure this discomfort and have this, these uncomfortable conversations and do this interpersonal work, I think, with our beloveds, um, especially in terms of, of of Trump specifically, um, it, I understand that it might be too difficult for some people, and I'm very grateful for my parents that mm -hmm. they've been willing to evolve with me and go on this journey with me. I understand that's not always the case, but I think it, for people listening, if, if they think that they can make a difference, that, that interpersonal work is a political act of love, not just for the person in your family or your friend, but for the collective, because the more we can invite people in to feel as if we can have honest, compassionate conversations, the more we can build to the equitable public power that we've been deprived. Right, and you just have to be willing to listen also, because you're going to disagree with people. It doesn't yes. matter if it's family, doesn't matter if it's conversations like this. There just needs to be nuance to those conversations, and that's kind of something we've lost a little bit of. So when you've been meeting with people, whether it's students or people from around the country, yeah. what's it like engaging with people who disagree with you? Because you're a very passionate <laughs> person. You're a person that, as a strong, progressive woman, you're going to scare some people with what uh -huh. you believe, uh just like AOC. <laughs> so, <That's> what, right. <laughs> so what is it like been dealing with that just on an everyday basis? Because this is your life, and this is a really public forum as well to do this thing. Well, 
Uh, I have been shocked mm. at how ugly the pushback is. Yeah. People really don't like a young woman raising her voice. And uh, I in have endured a lot of really ugly harassment from far-right fringe groups, mm -hmm. attacks on my character from my colleagues in New York media. It's so much more aggressive um, than I could have ever expected it to be. Early on, uh, it was so extreme that I actually got sick. Mm. It was just, the stress, just my body shut down. And when I came out of that, I had to really think about what I'm doing and, and what I stand for and, and find a solid core and a sense of self and, and think about what is the purpose of this work. And I, I understood that so much of the harassment and ugliness is, is, is simply about trying to get me to shut up. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I've had to understand that just continuing to raise my voice, I'm not always going to be right. right. I'm going to make mistakes, and I do all the time. But I need to keep raising my voice and evolving in public and, and practicing my right to political agency. I think especially um, in the form that young women are socialized to talk, because there's so few people that look and act like me in the conversation. Absolutely. And, 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 and it would be totally reasonable for me to have quit during several moments um, over the past three years. And the reason I keep going is because there's not enough people um, holding up this mantle, and it's not easy being on the crest of the wave. And, and I see the way young women react to me at colleges and at high schools, where they'll, they'll, there's one young girl, and she said, she was touching her hair, mm -hmm. she was saying like an um, and she came up to me and she said, you know, you started talking and you were touching your hair, and you were saying like an um, and I thought, why did they bring this woman here to talk to us? <laughs> and then I started actually listening to you. It was like, the I was watching her realize the extent of her own internalized misogyny, and the reality is the, the political conversation has looked like mm. the type of person who looks like Wolf Blitzer for yeah. so long that we don't even realize how absurd it is. Yeah, and the fact that that little girl wouldn't have the confidence to even think that she's comfortable in her own skin. You exactly. Know? Because the people that she's looking at don't look like her. But the great news is that whether it's you, AOC, plenty of other women, there are people that look like her now. There are all different types of people. So in a positive way, mm -hmm. what's it been like to see some of the changes, whether it's through Black Lives Matter or through the Me Too movement? What, what have been some of the most profound changes you've witnessed the last couple of years? I think the, the, the most profound shift is that we're really seeing the shape of the white supremacist capitalist patriarchy in clear terms. Mm. So we're, um, and it began with the Black Lives Matter movement before Trump, so this political awakening is a shift from passively navigating a broken system to actively seeking to change it based on seeing the status quo and understanding your role in it. And the idea of wokeness came out of the Black Lives Matter movement because it's about seeing structural inequalities, not just singular one-off tragedies, but the reality of a system of oppression that perpetuates them. And I think the most amazing thing is this rise of an awareness um, of the bizarre secret rules that make it so that any given straight white man is given a sense of automatic authority mm -hmm. in a way that we s simply just don't even think to question a lot of the time. And that's it, questioning. That's really the key. Like, we're not doing enough of that. And yeah. when people in power do get questioned, you can see how they take it. And <laughs> if they don't have the spine to take it, then you really get to find out who that person is. Or in a time of really difficult decision making, if a person doesn't rise up to do the right thing, then I always say, like, we really know who that person is. And yes. we've seen a lot of who these people really are the last couple of years in a Donald Trump White House. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Simply said right there. Simply said. <laughs> so with, with your career, like, you've obviously catapulted to a public way that I'm sure you didn't anticipate. No. Nope. I read this BuzzFeed article on you, and, like, that must have been a crazy day for you because you're just trying to put this thing out there and just improve the lives of others. Yet we get to this point where it's like, Person X enters the media space, they're doing a great thing, but then it's like, can we tear this person down? Uh, What's wrong with this person? So just from like a personal level, how did you deal with that day and what was that like for you? I'm, I've been really frustrated with how my work has been handled. I, I feel that that BuzzFeed article has tried to slander me as ridiculous mm -hmm. and silly and it's making these attacks on my character and not engaging at all with my work. Right. Um, I'm doing serious journalistic work here. This book it took years of research and reporting, and the goal of it is to empower people to participate as citizens. I, I'm at a loss. Uh, I had a real test of faith, I think, when that article came out, because I've poured myself into this, and I've endured so many excruciating mm -hmm. attacks 
from the expected cast of characters. And the shape of this was different. Um, and it was it's a level of mean girl toxicity. It's crazy. That I, yeah. I was, it was very painful to process. I I think that it's also made me realize how committed I am mm -hmm. to continuing this, and it made me soul search yet again um, and remember what I give crap about mm -hmm. in in this whole project, and that is doing the work to empower people with information. I think that so much political writing, so much of the shape of the discussion from our elected officials and from our journalistic gatekeepers, it boxes people out. It doesn't, not just young people, but especially young people. Yeah, totally. I mean, th we're told this, like, this, this myth of youth apathy where where is the outreach? Right. Where is the exciting stuff that uh, young people obviously like? Like the way I like to, to frame it is, you we all know how to market to the Instagram generations. Mm -hmm. You know what the font looks like. You get the potted plant. You have the neon sign. <laughs> like what what kind of crap do they have as a stocking stuffer at Urban Outfitters? Right. And that's all so conspicuously missing. Also, just stuff that's entertaining. Sure. And I think what makes me distinct and the work part of what makes me powerful is I'm. Funny, and I'm charismatic, and I'm trying to reach people and entertain them in while, a different way. Yes, yeah. while giving them the tools that they need to participate as citizens. I'm not trying to get everyone to agree with me. Mm -hmm. My goal is to have as many people as possible feel empowered to raise their voices and make their political opinions manifest. And I think young people and young women, even more so, at whatever level of marginalization compounded on youth, but youth especially is we've been told we don't have permission. We've been treated as if we're second class citizens, mm -hmm. as if we don't have what it takes to be making these decisions. And it's not a mistake that we don't feel like we have permission, that we don't feel like we have access. And uh, I, I'm going to, I'm sure that I will continue to make mistakes. I'm sure that I will continue to receive attacks and I'm sure that I will continue to keep going. You have to keep going. That is definitely <laughs> the key. And especially given everything that's going on right now. And as we look forward to 2020 now, on the Democratic side, obviously a lot of people in the mix right now are going to whittle that down a little bit, but uh -huh. what are you most interested in when it comes to those Democratic candidates, whether it's the themes of the races right mm -hmm. now, the people in there, what, what is piquing your interest right now? What's piquing my interest is, is that the way that we can talk about a future of, of structural change mm -hmm. and that is beyond what we can imagine. I, I think that the, 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 the realities of the system are, have created, especially for young people, a sense of economic precarity, widespread inequality. We have the climate crisis, we have gun reform, we have health care, we have all of these. Those are big issues that the majority of Americans want solutions on. And we're told that we're meant to accept a lack of solutions for those problems as just the way things are. Oh, gridlock in Washington. Oh, moneyed interest. Oh, a, a, a geographically biased electoral mm -hmm. system. Gerrymandering. Right. I don't know. That's the way it's it like, is. No, maybe we should try and change something. And yeah. it, it, I, I would, I think what makes me hopeful is the idea that we don't even know. Mm -hmm. We don't even know what the better future looks like yet. And so I like to think of this as like caterpillar to butterfly. And right now we're in the cocoon and it sucks. Like we're, we are really like pumping our yep. wings, but it's, it's just about dreaming to something bigger because we can't, we can't even understand what it would be like for us all to fully have this sense of agency for equitable public power to really exist. And what it would actually look like if we spread the wealth and power of this nation among the people and put everyone on equal political footing. Mm. And I think that looks like all of these different um, inequities in terms of, of youth and people who are older. And then that extends to the moneyed interests, where if you're older, you have more affluence. And basically, our electoral system right now, those power structures are catering to corporate overlords and the few older, wealthy white people who are showing up to vote, and, and it's not an accident. And I think what is exciting about the primary is that there's a new moral baseline on, on all of the issues that are most pressing, mm -hmm. uh, climate crisis, immigration, gun reform, and health care, um, and that it, we are insisting on doing things differently and figuring out this better way and, and no longer being held back by these constraints on social imagination that are perpetuated by people in power who are held hostage by moneyed interests. Yeah, and also we just need some time because even a person like you, a few years ago you weren't in this conversation. No. We're <laughs> gonna have new elected officials that are going to be in positions of power that weren't here before. And also we just need some time to reflect on things because like years down the road, like people will ask like, how did 2016 happen, right? There's gonna be that question. Yeah. And we're gonna to have to explain it. And so have you thought about the idea of like, 
you know, going from President Obama to Trump to maybe the first woman president <laughs> or something like that? Like, have you let your mind wander like that? Oh, I have <laughs> let my mind wander. <laughs> yes, I, um, I would say yes. And I'm excited about those possibilities, but also... Realistic? Well, no, but also we structural change is not going to come from any leader. Right. And we need... And what I argue for in this book is we need to all be consistently, constantly, actively participating as citizens. And it extends beyond any election. It extends beyond voting. So, so to be clear, please, everyone, vote, <laughs> register, vote, Just make it vote, happen. vote, 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 like, please, get your friends, vote, like, please, God, vote, go to vote, the like, vote, vote. But voting is this, this most basic transactional level of right. citizenship, and we all have to be thinking out of the box in terms of what are the what are the activities of citizenship that most resonate with us? Yeah. Like, what's your particular issue? What are you passionate about? How do you think the world could be better? And it could be as simple and as local as in installing a countdown clock where at, 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 a, at an intersection mm -hmm. in your neighborhood. But how are you going to participate in the question of how we live together? And, and what are the actions you can take to make your political opinion manifest? And, and I think uh, there, there are some concrete options, but it really, they're limitless. So maybe it's what fits into your schedule. If, for example, if you were going to start to get in shape, I mean, you look like in shape, right? But if you were, <laughs> if you were like, oh, I can get in better I've shape. been eating yeah. Cheetos, like I've been on the couch, it's there. time for me to, to find a new way. Mm -hmm. You would be like, what's the best workout for me? What kind of classes am I going to take? What kind of gym am I going to go? When am I going to do that? That's kind of how we have to think about democracy. Yeah, just get yourself in the game. Sometimes yeah. you're going to skip it. Sometimes it's going to not feel that great to be doing it. But we have to be flexing this muscle all mm -hmm. of the time. And so it means maybe it's contacting elected officials. Maybe it's showing up for the protest. Maybe it's making donations if you have the means. Like The list goes on and on. But it's, it's just constantly thinking critically and insisting on this sense of political agency. We have to actively build it. And, and I would add... This book is a is a very optimistic, and yeah. I make a very strong case for political optimism. And I would acknowledge that there is a cynical reality. We are in a system that that boxes out and oppresses our voices, and not just for the young. And individual action can feel like it doesn't matter. Uh, it is statistically it not significant, it but it matters. must build. Yeah. We have to build our individual action to ev have any shot at collective power. And, and it, it's, it's, it's as simple as, yeah, if I throw out my plastic water bottle in the garbage can, it's not going to make a big difference. But if we are all recycling. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, Just little things like that. Not, so we, we, we all have to do it. And I think we, we not only have a right, but we have a duty. Um, and it, it's something that we have to do all the time, no matter who our next president is. No doubt about it. Lauren, really nice to meet you. Thank Thanks you. Thanks so much. Check out her book. It's a great read. For Lauren, I'm DJ. <laughs> See you next time here on The Sit Down.